This is Inorganic Chemistry, Chapter 5, Transition Metals, pages 176 through 183. We're going to look at how to name complexes of transition metals and what are called coordination complexes. So just a flashback to valence bond theory. Recall that a covalent bond is formed according to valence bond theory when atoms donate a single electron, one each, to form a shared pair. Well, many bonds might in fact form that way, but certainly not all of them. In coordination compounds, they're more like acid-base reactions. If you recall, acid-base reactions. A Lewis base is an electron pair donor and it donates to a, a Lewis acid which is an electron pair acceptor and that forms a coordinate covalent bond so one atom donates both electrons the other one accepts them both to form a shared pair. Here's an example of such. Ammonia is a Lewis base it's got an electron pair to donate and hydrogen ion is an electron acceptor, a Lewis acid. And so Nitrogen donates a non-bonded pair of electrons to the hydrogen ion and forms this bond. So let's look at it this way. Nitrogen already has three covalent bonds to hydrogen in ammonia. Something like this. Nitrogen and hydrogen are sharing an electron pair. But then hydrogen cation has an empty orbital and the nitrogen has an unshared pair. And the formation of the coordinate covalent bond would be like this. One atom donates both electrons and here's that bond. Second example, ammonia again acting like a base or electron pair donor and BF3 is going to act as a Lewis acid. Now BF3 doesn't have any hydrogen ions but it does accept electrons. It has an empty orbital it has an incomplete octet. So first of all, nitrogen has three bonds, covalent bonds to hydrogen, perhaps something like this, here, here, and here, and it has a non-bonded pair of electrons, here they sit. Similarly, boron has three covalent bonds to fluorine, perhaps like so, but boron has an empty orbital here. And so the Lewis base, the nitrogen, donates a pair of electrons to form the covalent bond with the boron. We could show it this way. So there it is. Coordinate covalent bonds. We're going to apply these right now to transition metals because it's believed that this is a model that best describes bond formation in transition metal complexes. Here's chromium-3. It's a Lewis acid. It has empty d orbitals. And here's six water molecules. The oxygen has non-bonded pairs of electrons. And six water molecules will actually bond with the chromium to form hexa-aqua. It's called aqua rather than water. Hexa-aqua chromium-3 cation. This is a coordination complex. Cobalt-3 reacts with ammonia. Six molecules of ammonia per single cobalt-3 cation forming hexa-amine cobalt-3 cation, a coordination complex. Nickel-2 reacts with four cyanides to form tetracyanonicolate-2 complex. Iron, an iron atom, reacts with five carbon monoxides to form tetracarbonyl iron complex. Silver-1 cation reacts with two ammonia molecules to form diamine silver one complex. All of these are coordination complexes. In the column on the right I have listed dissociation constants for some of these complexes. For example, look at the dissociation constant of the diamine silver complex. 6.3 times 10 to the minus 8. What does that number mean? Well, take a look on the sidebar here. Let's consider 
the formation reaction of the amine from silver and two moles of ammonia. We could write an equilibrium expression for this reaction. The molar concentration of the products divided by the product of the molar concentration of the reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. Probably a familiar expression to you. This equilibrium expression is sometimes called the formation constant. Now reactions are reversible. Let's consider the reverse reaction. Let's consider the dissociation of the diamine silver complex forming silver and two moles of ammonia. The equilibrium expression for this would be the product of the molar concentration of the products raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation divided by the molar concentration of the reactants. The equilibrium expression for this is sometimes called the dissociation constant because it gives an extent to which the, the complex dissociates. The value is 6.3 times 10 to the minus 8 in this case. What does that mean? Well it means that that reaction, that dissociation reaction does not produce, proceed very far. It means that there is very small concentration of dissociation products and a very large concentration of undissociated product which says that these complexes are in fact very stable. Look at some of the other ones. Very small dissociation constants meaning that these are in fact very stable compounds. Let's look at some nomenclature. So Lewis bases anions or molecules bonded to the central Lewis atom are called ligands and the word ligand in Latin means to tie or bind. I have a definition over here. In English we have ligament. Ligaments are connective tissues that join bones or cartilage together. Hence the word ligand is something that it's an electron donor that forms the bond that ties the coordination complex together. Now charged coordination complexes like this one here, diamine silver, will also have counter ions associated with them. You can't buy a jar of just a cation or just an anion. They always come in a match set such that the total charge is zero. For example, what you might purchase is diamine silver nitrate. The anion is the counter ion. Now counter ions are ionically bonded and when dissolved in water the nitrate ion, the counter ion, will separate from the complex. But the two nitrogen amines ligands are firmly bound to the silver ion by covalent bonds so those won't separate on dissolving. The number of atoms bonded to the central atom or ion in a coordination complex is referred to as the coordination number. In the example above, silver has a coordination number of two since there are two pairs of electrons donated to it. And coordination complexes occur with coordination numbers anywhere from two all the way up to twelve, although two, four, and six are most common. Now you ask, are in fact coordination complexes important? Well, indeed they are. For example, hemoglobin, kind of important stuff. Blood protein is a coordination complex involving iron. Vitamin B12 is a cobalt coordination complex called cyanocobalamin. Thialocyane, blue, is a copper complex dye used in the manufacture of blue jeans and inks. EDTA is a ligand that binds quite strongly with metals such as calcium, magnesium, iron, aluminum, and forms a coordination complex. Now this reagent is used in the lab in determining water hardness and it's used in industry and in the home for softening water, removing the calcium and magnesium and iron and aluminum and forming these coordination complexes that are soluble. An antidote for some metal poisonings is British anti-lewisite and it forms complexes with arsenic, mercury, and chromium that someone may have been poisoned with. Iron carbonyls are coordination complexes 
use an anti knock gasoline additive. So yes, they are quite important. Now, on the bottom of page 177, I have a list of uh, geometries and hybridization states. Well, the geometries are quite similar, or pretty much the same as we learned in VSEPR. We say that the ligands are like charged and will move as far apart from each other as they can in three-dimensional space. So if we had two ligands, we'd expect them to be linear. If we had three, they would be a flat triangle, although that doesn't seem to occur very often with transition metals. If we had four ligands, tetrahedral would be expected. And we will see later on some cases where we actually get a flat square plane structure. We'll talk about the difference in the significance later. If you have five ligands around a central metal cation, uh, they would be triangular bipyramidal. And if we had six, then we'd have an octahedral structure. Now we won't concern ourselves with the hybridization states of the metal cations in coordination complexes, although I have some listed here. The reason is that this is part of valence bond theory being applied to transition metal coordination complexes. And it doesn't have any useful predictive power. And so instead we're going to describe coordination complexes using a different model called crystal field theory, which is more successful in predicting properties. So on page 178, I want to introduce you to ligands. Ligands that are in complex ions are molecules or their anions with one or more donor atoms, each donating a lone pair or unbonded pair of electrons to the metal to form a covalent bond. Ligands are Lewis bases. The metal ion is the Lewis acid. The complex that's formed is called a Lewis adduct. Now think about this. Because they have at least one lone pair or unbonded electron pair, donor atoms usually come from groups 5 or 6 or 7a. If you look up here at the top of the page, group 5a atoms, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, after they bond, we'll have a non-bonded pair of electrons. Consider ammonia. It has a non-bonded pair of electrons. That would be the donor atom in the ligand. And so being in group 5, it has that non-bonded pair. Look at group 6A, something like water. In a water molecule, oxygen, it's from group 6A. It has two non-bonded pairs of electrons that can donate and act as a ligand. In group 7A, we have the halogens and I'll just write it as X. Now, the halogen is usually an anion, like a chloride or a bromide or iodide, as opposed to um, a hydrohalic acid like HCl. So group 5, 6, and 7A contains atoms that have non-bonded pairs of electrons that act as ligands. Now, ligands are named as unidentate, bidentate, or polydentate. Let me show you some. Unidentate ligands donate just one pair of electrons. So although oxygen has two pairs, it would only donate one. Fluoride is unidentate, donating one pair of electron. Hydroxide, and all the other examples in here, when they only donate one pair of electrons, they're called unidentate. A bidentate ligand, as the name implies, donates two pairs of electrons. So this compound, ethylene diamine, two amine groups, has two nitrogens, each donating a pair of electrons to the same central transition metal cation, and so it is actually bidentate. Oxalate ion comes from oxalic acid after it's completely deprotonated. It has two carboxylate groups, each oxygen donating a pair of electrons, it is in fact bidentate. We have some that donate more than two, and we'll call those polydentate. So this compound is diethylene, there's the two ethylene groups, triamine, there's the three amine groups. Each nitrogen can donate a pair of electrons, so it's actually tridentate, referred to as polydentate. And EDTA, which I mentioned earlier, is ethylene, there's ethylene, diamine, tetraacetate. Each of these groups is an acetate group. 
the conjugate base of acetic acid. And since there are four of them, each of the anionic oxygens can donate. It's polydentate. It's actually tetradentate in this case. On the bottom of page 178, there's a list of ligands in order from weak donors to strong donors. And this isn't of great importance yet. We'll get to this at the end of the chapter when we talk about crystal field theory, but I want to mention it here. This list does not follow basicity. So notice that water is a better ligand, stronger ligand than hydroxide, even though hydroxide is a stronger base. So the ability of water to donate electrons to a transition metal cation is in fact greater than the ability of hydroxide to donate a pair of electrons to an acid. So they're not exactly uh, consistent, but there's similarities. On page 179, I have a table of ligands, which we should look at. So Lewis bases, these ligands may be anions or molecules. Rarely would they be cations. If it's going to donate electrons, it's unlikely a cation could do that with any ability. Now the donor atom is the atom of the ligand that actually donates the electrons. In the table, I've underlined the atoms that are actually doing the donating, specifically and usually from groups 5 and 6 and 7a, as we said. So let's look at a few. Ammonia, donating through the nitrogen. In the coordination name, it's referred to as amine rather than ammonia with a double M. Water donating through its oxygen is called aqua. Carbon monoxide is called carbonyl. Phosphine is called phosphine. Nitric oxide is called nitrosal. So kind of odd names, but you can just look these up as you need them. Next we're going to look at some anions, and you'll notice that the anions names are truncated and end in O. So nitrate is nitrate O and amide is amide O and oxalate is oxalato. Another not notice here, we see an asterisk. Now an asterisk implies or tells us that the ligand is actually bidentate. So oxalate has two carboxylate groups, two oxygens that donate a pair of electrons, so it's bidentate. The same is true of carbonate, or carbonato. It is bidentate. Now oxide, which is simply O minus 2, called oxo, and it actually is bidentate, even though it's a singular atom, or ion, it can donate two pairs of electrons, so it actually is bidentate. Chloride is called chloro, fluoride, fluoro, cyanide is cyano, hydroxide, hydroxo. Then we have nitrite, nitrite. Now nitrite, NO2 minus, can actually donate through the nitrogen or through the oxygen, and the names it's named differently. So when nitrite donates through the nitrogen, it's referred to as nitro, and in formulas, it's written NO2. But when nitrite donates through the oxygen, it's named as nitrito, and the, the formula is written ONO. Sulfate is sulfate O, and notice that it is bidentate. Thiocyanate is thiocyanato. Thiosulfate is thiosulfate O. Notice it's bidentate. And finally, pyridine, C6H5N, is simply pyridine. One more term before we start to name these. Coordination sphere. The coordination sphere is the metal and its ligands, but not the uncoordinated counter ions. So, for example, in this compound, hexaamine cobalt-3 chloride, it's the hexaamine cobalt-3 that is the coordination sphere, it's the part that contains the transition metal, not the chloride. Now what follows are a series of rules for naming coordination compounds, and this is a great reference for you to use when you're doing the test, 
but it's a bit overwhelming I found to just read through them so I found it better to approach it a little differently we'll break it down a bit so here on page 180 I want to point out to that there are in fact three different kinds of coordination complexes there are cationic coordination complexes in which the transition metal is in the cationic coordination sphere there are neutral complexes in fact they are neutral the total charge is zero and there are anionic coordination complexes in which the transition metal is part of the anion and there are slight differences in naming anionic complexes compared to the first two again the rules that follow are great references but I'd rather present this uh, just teaching it as I go so if you go to page 181 we'll work through some examples here I want to draw some comparisons to normal inorganic nomenclature we'll start with that recall that for normal inorganic nomenclature the cation is listed first and then the anion with a space between them as in, as in sodium chloride and of course the sum of all the positive and negative charges must equal the total charge the same is still true so this is silver chloride its name this is not a coordination complex it's simply inorganic nomenclature the name is silver chloride now silver has a charge of plus one but it's always and only plus one as a cation so we're not going to name it any more than we'd call sodium chloride sodium one chloride if there's only one oxidation state for a cation it is not listed the same is true for coordination complexes this next compound is iron chloride but in this case iron has more than one oxidation number and so it must be stated because there is more than one kind of iron chloride so the total negative charge is minus two the total charge on the compound is zero because it's an invisible zero the iron therefore must be plus two and we'd name this as iron two chloride the next example is simply ammonium chloride ammonium has a charge of always and only plus one so it's not stated it's a complex cation here we have our first coordination complex cation first then anion so when naming these complexes the ligands although they're listed after the metal in the formula the ligands are always named first and when they're the same we use a prefix we would never say mono but we do say di if there's two tri if there's three and so on so in this case this is di and the ligand name for ammonia is amine double M and amine then silver there's no space between the ligand and the metal name diamine silver then there's a space and we follow it by the anion name which is nitrate so it's not unlike what we saw up here silver chloride diamine silver nitrate now again silver only has one oxidation state so it is not stated in the name that is the correct name the only space that's listed here is between the anion and cation as we saw up here now this next one has two types of ligands the ligands are listed first but in what order well the rule is that we list them alphabetically based on the ligand name itself so C in chlorine comes before F in fluorine we also must list the prefixes to tell how many they are the prefixes are not alphabetized go with the ligand name this will be di chloro tri fluoro no spaces manganese now manganese has more than one oxidation state we'll come back and fill it in a moment and the anion's name is a sulfate that's the only space is between the cation and the anion dichloro trifluoro manganese something sulfate so what's the something let's work it out sulfate has a total charge of minus two and since the total charge of the anion and cation must equal zero we know the coordination complex sphere is plus two now within that we see there's three fluorides minus minus three and two chlorides minus two 
and we have the manganese. Those must all add together to give us plus 2. So what with negative 5 combines to make plus 2 it would be plus 7 written in Roman numerals. That's the highest oxidation state of manganese. Let's try it again. Notice what I've changed up here is the number of chlorides and fluorides. This time we have three chlorides. This would be tri chloro difluoro manganese seven sulfate. I just wanted to emphasize that the ligands are alphabetized based on the first letter in the ligand name. C comes before F. The prefixes are not alphabetized. Even though T wouldn't precede D and I, they're not alphabetized. Next example here. We have two ligands again. Ligands are listed first. Do you recall the name of water as a ligand? You can look it up in the table at your convenience. It's aqua. Dichloro. So we never use the prefix mono. If there's only one, it's simply not stated. So it's aqua dichloro iron something chloride. What's the charge on iron? Well, the total negative charge is minus 1. Therefore, the total positive charge must be plus 1 because there is no charge shown in the complex, so they must add to be 0. Well, let's break it down. Within the complex, we have negative 2 for the chlorides, nothing for the water. Iron plus negative 2 must add to plus 1. So therefore, iron must be plus 3. That's its highest oxidation state. There's one other thing I want to point out to you here and that is that water is written in parentheses. This is unusual. Think about this. If you have sodium hydroxide, hydroxide is a polyatomic ion, but we do not use parentheses on it, right? It's just NaOH. Now, if you have more than one of a polyatomic ion in regular inorganic nomenclature, we would put parentheses around it. Not so in transition metal coordination complex formulas. Even if there's only one of the polyatomic ion, you would you'd put it in brackets. So always put them in parentheses. And probably it's because there's often so many of these atoms strung together, it certainly makes uh, it clear what we're trying to see. Okay, the next example has oxide as an anion, but it also has oxide as a ligand, and the names are different. So we're going to have two of these oxide ligands. Now what is that? Let me point that out to you on the table. I've pulled them over here. So there's oxide, O minus 2. As a ligand it's called oxo, as in simply the anion, it's called oxide. Notice that it is bidentate. So it's going to be called oxo. But it's not going to be written dioxo. For bidentate ligands, I'm going to write this incorrectly. It is not dioxo. Okay, that's wrong. What are we going to say? For bidentate ligands and polydentate ligands, we use a different set of prefixes other than di and tri. Perhaps it's just to alert us to the fact that they are polydentate. Instead, we use the prefixes bis for di, tris for tri, tetricus for tetra, pentacus for penta, and so on. So anytime the ligand is bidentate or polydentate, the prefix is changed to one of these. There's one other case where we would use the prefix bis or tris or tetricus. If the ligand has a, a prefix already in it, Frank's example, this ligand is diethylene triamine. And the name of the ligand has a prefix already built into it. So rather, if we had two of these groups, instead of writing di, diethylene triamine, 
That's not done. Instead, we write the word bis. So bis is used whenever we have polydentate ligands, bidentate ligands, or a ligand. It may be monodentate, but it has a prefix already built into the name. Furthermore, I'll, I'll show it here. I'm going to write bis oxo tungsten something oxide. So something else I want to point out is that whenever you use the prefixes bis or tris or tetricus, then whatever follows that ligand is always put in parentheses as I've done here. So what is the charge on the tungsten? Let's work it out. So we have oxide is minus 2. The coordination sphere must therefore be plus 2 because those obviously equals the invisible 0. Within the coordination sphere we have two oxides from minus 4 plus the charge on the tungsten must equal plus 2. So what is tungsten? Well, it must be 6. So this is bis oxo tungsten 6 oxide. How about the next one here? Cationic coordination sphere, something chloride. We list the ligands first. We write them after the metal in the formula, but they're listed first in the name. This would be tetra aqua zinc chloride. Do we write the oxidation number for zinc? No, because zinc only has one oxidation number. Another thing I want to point out to you is we do not drop vowels. Many times in regular inorganic nomenclature you'll see that a duplicate letters, duplicate vowels, one will be dropped, but not so in this case. Just keep them all. It's actually easier that way. There's less confusion. All right, so far we've been dealing with coordination complexes that have a cationic coordination sphere. What about anionic coordination spheres? They're similar, but there's a slight difference. Again, we're going to list the cation first. In this case, it's just sodium, not disodium, just sodium. You wouldn't write sodium oxide. You would not name that disodium oxide. It's simply sodium oxide leave a space and write the name of the anion and the hydroxyl groups is listed first so that would be tetra hydroxo and then we have zinc now there's a difference here in regular nomenclature you know that um, we change the name of an atom such as chlorine when it is anionic, we change the ending to chloride, so it has a new ending. The same is done for the metals in the coordination sphere when the coordination sphere is anionic. We put the suffix 8 on the end of it, zinc 8, and you're familiar with things like phosphate and carbonate, nitrate, sulfate. They, they signal to us that it's anionic, and so that's the convention here. Sodium tetrahydroxo zincate. How about the next one here? We have tetraamine double A double M iron, no spaces yet. Iron is polyvalent. Leave a space. Let's figure it out after. Then chloride. So what is the charge the iron. Three chlorides minus three. Coordination sphere must be plus three. The ammonias are zero and the iron therefore must give the charge of plus three. So that's tetraamine iron three chloride. Let's look at it again but now the iron is in the anionic sphere. Cations listed first. That's sodium. Space tetrachloro. Now, are we going to write iron? Let me write it down, but don't write this yet. Iron 8. Ooh, that's difficult to say. Turns out there are six metals whose names are clumsy or awkward, and in those cases 
we use the Latin name for the metal rather than the English name. And in this case, ferrum is the Latin name. So this would be tetrachloro ferrate followed by the charge. I'll come back to the name in just a second. Let's finish this up. Sodium is plus one. Anionic sphere must add to be minus one. Four chlorides, negative four, plus iron, adds to be minus one. What is iron? Plus three. So we have sodium tetrachloroferrate three. So how do you know which metals keep their English name and which change the Latin name. Well, there's a total of six of them, and I'm going to scroll back up a couple pages to the screen that has those listed, and you'll have this available on a test. So you just need to remember to look it up. Here they are. This is uh, rule number seven regarding naming coordination complexes. All right. So here we have for anionic complexes the suffix eight is added to the end of the stem of the metal name so zinc becomes zinc eight. Latin names of metals are used when English names are clumsy. For example, ferrate not iron eight. Plumbate instead of lead eight. Stanate replaces tinate. Orate not gold eight. Argentate instead of silver eight, and cuprate, not coprate. Those are the only six that have special Latin names used. The other ones you simply truncate it at some point and add an A-T-E ending. When is that done? Only when the metal is in the anionic coordination sphere. If it's cationic, use the regular English name only. All right, so how about the next one? Cationic coordination sphere. Ligands listed first, dye. Cyano is the name for cyanide. Gold, not orate. Gold is in the cationic coordination sphere. Use the regular English name. Gold has more than one oxidation state. We'll figure it out in a second. Leave a space and write the anion chloride. Okay, so what is the charge on the gold? Chloride's minus one. Therefore, the cationic coordination sphere must be plus one. Within that sphere, we have minus two for the cyanides plus the gold must add to be plus three. So what is gold? It's going to be plus three. This is dicyano gold three chloride. Now we have gold in the anionic coordination sphere. List the cation first, potassium. Leave a space and write the anion. List the ligands first. This will be tetra cyano now, because gold is in the anionic sphere, we have to use its Latin name, which is orate. And gold has more than one oxidation number, so what is it in this case? Potassium is plus one. The coordination sphere is anionic. It's minus one. Within the sphere, we have four cyanides plus gold adds together to give minus one. Therefore, gold, again, is plus three. Potassium tetracyanoorate. Here we have cationic coordination sphere. List the ligands first. Diamine. Copper, not cuprate. Anionic coordination sphere, use cuprate. Cationic, use the regular English name. Copper something oxidation number, space, iodide. Let's figure out what the oxidation number of copper is. Iodides, minus two. Coordination sphere, plus two. Within the sphere, ammonia, zero. Therefore, copper must provide that charge of plus two. This is diamine copper two iodide. Last example, we have transition metal in the anionic coordination sphere. We list the cation first. This would simply be lithium space anion. What's the anion? Tetra cyano. We have to use the Latin name for copper. That would be cuprate. And copper has more than one oxidation state. Let's see. Lithium, there's two of them, is plus two. The anionic sphere has a charge of minus two. 
within the sphere there's four iodides. Copper plus or minus four must be equal to minus two. Therefore, what's copper? It must be plus two. So lithium tetracyanocuprate. That's probably enough examples to show you how to name coordination complexes. So on page 182, there are a series of examples of how to write formulas and how to write names. There's a few rules at the bottom which are worth your reading. Here's some more examples. The answers to these are given at the very end of the chapter. On page 183 is another page of problems for you to work on if you need to practice. And also the answers for these are given at the end of chapter 5. And that concludes this chapter on naming transition metal complexes.